Uh, this is the first chapter in materials, uh, mechanical properties of materials. So this is materials overview page. We call it the uh, assessment document, but it's just how do you pass the subject materials? You do these all these topics, uh, and basically you fill in you you fill in everything in this ta table. And once this table is completed, you should have completed the subject. So the very first one. This is the first chapter in materials mechanical properties. I do have some videos already done of these, so there, there they are linked at the top of the page. <clears throat> so um, we have a look at those at any time. The main um, thing that we want to know from this chapter is a bunch of words, and the words are common words, but when it comes to engineering, they have sometimes a bit of a different meaning. So, for example, we might call something elastic. In, uh, in day to day language, but we wouldn't normally in day to day consider glass to be an elastic material. Well, in engineering, glass is elastic, very much an elastic material. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we normally think of elastic as how far it stretches, but engineering doesn't really say that. It says whether or not it goes back to the original shape when you take the load off. So those are the definitions that we're going through. We need to be quite specific on those definitions. They've got to be very accurate because uh, there can be some confusion because, for example, toughness and strength can be opposites in materials. How's that? So normally we would think if something's tough and strong, they're almost the same word. Well, they're not, not in engineering. Okay, and of course, um, we're mainly dealing with the engineering side of materials. There could be other things that we want to know about materials, like the chemical properties or magnetic properties or electrical properties. Um, but we're after mechanical properties. It's called mechanical, and that's mainly to do with stress. Okay, so here we go. We're going through the words first up. The first word we're meeting is elasticity, and there's the definition. Elasticity is the ability of a material to return to its original size after being deformed. Um, so when you let go, in other words, it goes back to its original size. So that applies to uh, most metals are elastic. And a material like rubber, that's elastic. Uh, but glass is also elastic. Now, of course, you won't often see glass stretching very far, but if you had a thin glass tube, you could bend it, or a plate, you'd be able to bend it, and when you let go, it'll flick back to the original. So it doesn't stay deformed, that's the point. The opposite of elasticity is plasticity, which means it does stay deformed. So in other words, the ability of a material to be deformed and stay like that after it's been removed, whereas elastic means that it goes back to the original when you let go. So they're opposites. Now, um, metals are also plastic. That's interesting because I just said metals are elastic. So what happens with uh, a lot of metals, uh, steel is a classic, is that they're elastic until you go too far. And when you've gone too far, now it's going to be bent permanently. So consider a spring. If you had a spring, you you pull the spring or squash the spring, depending on tension compression spring. But if you go too far, for example, in tension, then you probably stretch the spring permanently. Now it's been deformed. So what happens with um, something like spring steel? It's being elastic at first, up to a point, as long as you don't go too far. Then if you go past that point, it starts to act plastic. There are two types of plastic. There's ductile and there's malleable. Ductile means it's plastic in tension, like chewing gum, for example. Uh, copper is a good example. Copper uh, can be stretched into wire nicely. Plastics are very ductile. They pull, they almost look like chewing gum when you pull a piece of plastic. And malleable means it's ductile in compression. Uh, lead's a good example. Um, and uh, most most of the materials that are ductile will also be malleable, but some materials are malleable but not very ductile. Lead's a pretty good example. Doesn't pull all that well; it just sort of breaks. 
is a bit ductile, but it's but it's um, not as ductile as say copper. All right, so they're the two first words: elasticity and plasticity. Right now to something a bit more mathematical: the word stress. Now, stress is really the intensity of force inside the material. Kind of like pressure, because it actually has the same um, units as pressure, pascals, and it has the same formula as pressure, force over area. What it refers to, though, is uh, it's kind of like pressure in a solid. Pressure is only for fluids, like liquids and gases, whereas stress is for a solid. The other difference is that pressure goes in every direction whereas stress has a particular direction for it in this example we've got a rod that's under force it's, it's holding a force through it and that force is spread out through the cross-sectional area of the rod so the amount of stress is equal to the amount of force divided by the area so if you have less area the stress goes up or if you have more force the stress will go up either way so in order to compare two different objects to see which one's going to break, you have to check the force and divide by the area to see what the stress is. And uh, the stress will be the thing that breaks it. If you go too high in stress, it could break. <clears throat> okay, the units we use in uh, engineering though for stress is not the pascal because the pascal is too small. As a matter of fact, a pascal is a newton per square meter. One newton per square meter. <coughs> so a newton <coughs> is about a tenth of a kilogram um, over a square meter, which is like a tabletop size. Um, a tenth of a kilogram over a tabletop size. That is about the same pressure as a piece of paper. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you had a piece of paper that was 100 GSM, grams, grams per square meter, 100 GSM, that's a little, just a little bit heavier than normal paper is usually about 70 or 80 so slightly heavy paper one square meter of it is exactly one pascal so pascals are really small pressures so that's too small for engineering because we're usually working with pretty strong materials like steel so that would be you know um, 250 million pascals so we so we're not writing these huge numbers we work in megapascals almost always so engineers nearly always work in megapascals when they're dealing with stress a megapascal is a newton per square millimeter which is convenient so if we work in millimeters we'll automatically get megapascals so for example in this diagram here if that force was 200 uh, 2000, 2000 newtons and the cross-sectional area was 50 then the stress is 2000 divided by 50 now that's 2000 newtons divided by 50 square millimeters and if you have a newton per square millimeter you get megapascals so that's 40 megapascals so if a 50 square millimeter rod can hold 2000 newtons which is about 200 kilograms then it'll be under 40 megapascals can steel handle that yes steel can handle about 250 megapascals so that would be quite safe 200 kilograms hanging off a 50 square millimeter that's about seven by seven rod should be able to handle 200 kilos all right now stress is not actually part of our words the words that we're dealing with here are actually known as properties so what is a property here's our definition right at the top of the page a property is something that will be measured the same regardless of the size of the piece of material. Um, so density is a property, but mass is not. Uh, the, so the length of something is not a property. Um, the stress is not a property, it's a measurement. Whereas elasticity, how elastic it is, that's a property. How plastic it is, that's a property. And we do have properties for stress, which are things like how much stress does it take to break it? Well, that's a property. That's a property called the ultimate strength. So when stress is used as a property, it's called strength. And we have a bunch of different types of strength for materials. 
We have the, the one that I just mentioned, the ultimate strength, particularly ultimate tensile strength, or also known as UTS, ultimate tensile strength. That's probably the most uh, commonly referred to property of a metal. What is the UTS? How much force, or how much stress can it handle before it breaks? There's another important one called the yield strength, and that is how much stress can it handle before it starts going permanently deformed. So back in here, we said metals start out elastic, and then you go too far, they become plastic. Imagine if you had a stainless steel ruler, and uh, you started to bend it. If you don't bend too far, when you let go, it'll come back and it'll be nice and straight. But if you go too far, you've now got yourself a bent ruler that's because you started to go into the plastic zone so it still springs back but not all the way so it's might be 90 percent elastic and then 10 percent plastic you, got, you went too far which means you went past the yield strength so obviously yield strength is lower than ultimate strength so you you start stretching something if you stay under the yield strength it will be elastic then if you go over the yield point or yield strength then it becomes plastic, you're now causing permanent deformation. We also have two types of stress, there's tensile which you end your pulling and compressive when you're squashing. There is one other type and that is the shear strength, that's when you're trying to slide it. Like if you were using a pair of scissors on something, you're trying to slide it apart. There's another one called fatigue strength, um, which is a bit more detail, we'll be looking at that um, a bit later. That's even lower than the yield strength, fatigue strength. Turns out that if you uh, apply loads on and off, the material uh, breaks more easily than if you just hold it on permanently. <coughs> now, I talked about the um, elastic, the elastic part of the stretching. Here we have a piece of this looks like the graph of a mild steel here, and it shows that the elastic part is this first little bit here where it doesn't stretch very far you by eye you wouldn't see any stretch at all it's tiny it's like about a tenth of a percent and then you get to this point here where it starts to diverge off the straight line this is the yield point in fact they're, they're doing this in um, quite detail because they've got three little different points referring to the yield point normally we just kind of say the whole area is a big yield point area uh, but you can be a bit more specific with uh, these limits here <clears throat> but see where it says yield stress that's the technical yield point or the elastic limit all right so it's suddenly starts to stretch plastically now from now on it's plastic deformation so uh, finally the very highest point we get which is up here is the ultimate stress or the ultimate strength of the material and then uh, it starts to weaken uh, just before it fractures because it's getting skinny <clears throat> getting smaller all right now this curve is a stress strain curve so this is the stress how high it goes strain is how much you stretch it and just like with stress if a material is really long and you measure the amount of deflection, that's not really fair because if you're trying to compare a long one and a short one, you have to keep the same proportion. So strain is really the proportion of stretch. For example, if we had some fencing wire and we're pulling it uh, to 50 megapascals, we might stretch it, you know, like um, 100 or 200 millimeters of stretch in the wire. Whereas if it was only 100 millimeters long, we, we could only stretch it, you know, like 0.1 millimeters. <clears throat> so, but if we measured strain instead, what we're doing is looking at the extension dividing by the original length, that strain. So that's really just proportion of stretch. I did say uh, earlier that there are, there are three types of stress. You got the you got tensile, which is pulling. You got compression, which is squashing and shear which is sliding so you can pull it squash it or slide it what are you pulling squashing or sliding anyway atoms so here we've got a zoomed up view of a piece of metal uh, and the blue things are atoms and we're going what can we do to those atoms well 
we can pull them that's tensile so when we pull a piece of material and it's elastic we're actually pulling the atoms apart and those atoms that are attracted to each other are pulling back like a spring so while it's elastic it's definitely acting just like a spring we can also compress the steel they say it's steel and when we do that the, the atoms are too close together and they want to spring back and go back to their original position which they're comfortable all right so that's our tensile stress this is compressive stress when we're squashing it right the other type is sliding so that's known as shear so I could be sliding it this way, which is sliding it up. So I'm trying to slide the atoms past the other. Or I could be trying to slide it down, which is trying to slide the other direction. So that's all you can do. There's nothing else you can do to a bunch of atoms. You can either pull them or squash them or try and slide them. Tensile, compression, and shear. You can even have both. You could have shear and tension or shear and compression. Of course, you can't have tension and compression unless you're talking two directions you could all right now we're going to refer to this uh, graph a few times a bit later because um, there's something else we want to explain it right stiffness now that we've got stress defined and we have strain defined we have the next one which is stiffness now the word stiffness in engineering is pretty much exactly what you used to in normal uh, language stiffness is definitely stiffness no confusion so stiffness is how much stress does it take to stretch it by a certain amount and the nice thing about stiffness is it's definitely a property of a material so if you know that something is made out of steel that means you know what the stiffness is immediately because all the steels have the same stiffness which is super handy for engineering because as soon as you know what the forces and loads are, you can then immediately um, calculate what the deflection will be. Um, let me give you an example of that. This is a steel beam supporting a house. And by measuring the deflection of the beam, which was about 20 millimeters, we can calculate the weight of the house that that beam is holding because we know the stiffness of the beam. There's the stiffness, that's the actual number for the stiffness of a beam. So there's the formula for it. The amount of weight, that's what W is, is blah, 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 that formula, maths. And the E in that formula is stiffness. And because it's made of steel, I didn't have to go and measure the steel because I know that it's made out of steel. And I can immediately say, oh, stiffness, 200,000, boom. And because of that number, I can work out that that beam is holding about 1.8 tons there you go just because we know what the stiffness is we can make lots and lots of calculations and predictions <clears throat> before we make it okay now the stiffness of materials you look it up um, in fact we have a table of properties for materials uh, which are available on the website just to make sure everyone uses the same number if you just go to the internet you might get slightly different numbers so around different spots on the internet there's this little i symbol it says get info if you click that you'll get a bunch of properties which, which are the properties that we use and for for example carbon steel this first one here is a pretty ordinary um, steel probably like what those steel beams are made of and these are the properties that we will be looking at and stiffness is E. If you want to know this, the definitions for all these letters, they're down the bottom of the page. And E is the modulus of elasticity. That's the proper name for stiffness. So, uh, yeah, stiffness is probably my favorite property because it really is very cool. Stiffness, by the way, is dependent on the atoms. So it's really a, a property of atoms. So how much do these atoms want to hold themselves together? Or how, how hard is it to stretch them apart? That's the stiffness. Of course, once you go past the yield point, the stiffness doesn't really apply anymore because you're getting plastic deformation. So it's only really applied in the elastic region. So the names that we have for stiffness are quite, um, there's quite a few of them actually. But the one that we like to use is this one, modulus of elasticity. 
uh, which is stiffness. Uh, and its capital E is the is the symbol for stiffness. It's also known as Young's modulus, or just the word modulus itself, because the modulus is stress divided by strain. In other words, the slope of the graph. So the steeper this is, the more stiff the material. Steel is actually a, a very stiff material. It's not that many materials that are stiffer than steel, so that's a good thing. It's nice and stiff. For example, steel is three times as stiff as aluminium. <coughs> aluminium glass is pretty similar. <coughs> so the um, the stiffness of a material is the um, modulus of elasticity in tension and compression. Pretty much the same. There's also stiffness in shear, which is different. It's usually about 40% of uh, of the tensile one. So steel is about 200,000 megapascals in tension and about 80,000 megapascals in shear. And in shear is known as the shear modulus. All right. I'm just going to skip over those two because they're a bit... Um, obscure. This little graph here is actually the genuine graph. This is a bit of a, um, a bodged one just so that we can colour everything in. This is mild steel. You know if you actually got a piece of mild steel and pulled on it in a tensile test, this graph comes directly off a tensile testing machine. Look how steep the elastic region is. It's almost a vertical line. So you put a specimen into a tensile tester, turn it on, you can easily go accidentally over the yield point without even noticing it. You've got to be careful that you don't turn it on too fast and it goes flying up to about here somewhere before you even realise that it started. It also means if you're going to constant speed, so it goes nice and slow up here, it's going to take you like an hour to break the whole thing because it'll be there forever going along this long, stretchy chewing gum stage of, uh, of mild seal getting longer and longer and longer. Could be like 20% longer. All right, yield point we've already talked about. Plastic deformation we've already talked about, although I'm going to go into more detail in a minute. There's the ductility, malleability, da da da. Now, there was thrown in there a special, that one should be, um, that should be um, bold there. A very important property called toughness. Now, toughness is completely different to everything else. Toughness is the amount of energy it takes to break it. The amount of energy it takes to break. That's toughness. So, a material might be hard, but not tough, like glass. So glass is really hard, but you can fairly easily smash the glass if you just hit it with a sharp object, you know, suddenly, or throw a ball at a Tesla or something and break the window. So toughness is um, not related to hardness. As a matter of fact, quite often toughness and hardness are opposites. Many materials that are not very hard are pretty tough. And many materials that are nice and hard are not very tough. And um, that's sort of what happens when you're trying to make materials do what you want. For example, imagine if I had mild steel and I decided, well, maybe these, these bolts, maybe I had a, um, a soft bolt, uh, maybe a 4.6. And then I, um, I wanted a harder bolt and I went up to a 12.9. It turns out the 4.6 volt is probably, at least an 8.8 .8 volt would be tougher than a 12.9 volt. Take more energy to break it because it's more ductile, it's going to bend and absorb energy before it breaks. Whereas the harder bolt will just snap more suddenly. Uh, if you think of an example, you know, you know a file, if you're filing steel, those are very, very hard because they don't want to wear out when you're rubbing against the steel. So they make them only hard. They don't care about how tough it is because they know that you're just going to rub it on the steel. You're not going to hammer with it. So they're about as hard as you can get your steel. It's a high carbon steel. It's hardened very hard. But if you put one of those in a vise and then you hit it with a hammer sideways, it'll just snap 
like a piece of chalk. They're not tough at all. Whereas you get a normal piece of steel, like just a, an ordinary steel uh, bar of the same size, and you try and hit that with a hammer, you just bend it and there's no way it'll break because it's very ductile. So you've made the material harder, but you've made it less tough. That's exactly what happens. As we harden the steel, it becomes less and less tough. So toughness and hardness are opposites. And it turns out that hardness is pretty closely related to strength. Usually when they're hard, they get stronger, but they get less tough. All right, so we'll, we'll talk about that um, often throughout the course. There's also resilience, which is uh, how much energy it takes up to the yield point. So that's really the um, important property for a spring. So that was how much energy up to here, whereas toughness is how much energy all the way to breakage, which is here. Now it turns out that toughness is also the area under the graph. So the more area under the graph, which is this zone in here, the more area, the more tough the material. So if it's really, really hard, goes way up here and then snaps instantly, then there's not a lot of area, so it's less tough. All right, another property is hardness. I'm just going to skip over these ones, which we kind of already covered. Hardness is um, the ability of the material to resist um, deformation, particularly um, deformation on the surface. And the two ways to check defam deformation is to dent it or to scratch it. Now, with most metals that have a bit of ductility, we'll try and dent the material. We measure the size of the dent. If the dent is big, then it's not as hard. If the dent is small, then it's hard. That's it. There's a number of different types of tests. They're called, uh, got different names like Rockwell and Vickers and Grinnell that are used for measuring the hardness of the material. If the material has no plasticity, like a ceramic, for example, uh, you can't dent them. If you try, you just smash it. So they, uh, their hardness is measured by scratching them. Uh, with something that's harder, obviously. <clears throat> uh, fairly, it's a fairly, uh, it's fairly accurate to, uh, to normal language. The one that, the one that's probably the most different to normal language would be toughness, because um, it's specifically about the energy it takes to break something. All right. So um, we're just going to finish off here with, um, we're going to look in a bit more detail at bolts themselves, what bolts um, and what the numbers on the bolts stand for, because uh, it's nice to know that. <coughs> um, zoom into that uh, picture. <coughs> Let's uh, remember how I, I had a mild steel picture. Well, the mild steel in this case would be this little bit uh, from here. So mild steel graph goes up here. Then there's a yield point. And then it continues along here, and we get the ultimate tensile strength there, and then it goes down and breaks. Snap. Right. So that's a curve for mild steel. Now, if we had a 4.6 bolt, uh, the 4 and the 6 are both um, in the graph. So what it stands for is the ultimate tensile strength of the bolt is the first digit times 100. So you get that digit times that by 100. So what does that give you? Equals 400. So this is a 400 megapascal ultimate tensile strength. So that's the megapascals of the tensile strength. <clears throat> that's the UTS. So they just have one digit for that. Well, they might have two. We have 12. And just times the first number by 100. And that will give you the, uh, before the decimal point, that little bit of 4.6 is a decimal place there. Times the first number times 100, that will give you the uh, 400 megapascal ultimate. That's this one here, 400. And then the point 0.6 stands for 60%. So 60%, or 0.6, same thing, 60%, is the yield point. So the yield stress of this material 
is 60% of 400, which is, um, is that the number there, 340? It doesn't sound right, does it? 60% of 400 is not. Point six times four hundred. Point six times four hundred. Okay, two forty. Oh, that says two forty. <coughs> That's a two. So we get a fair bit of information just from those numbers stamped on the top of the bolt. We know that the ultimate tensile strength is four hundred megapascals. We also know the yield point is two hundred and forty megapascals. That's it. So a stronger bolt would be a 6.8. <clears throat> that means the ultimate tensile strength is 600 megapascals, and the yield point is 80% of the 600, which is 480 megapascals. So we've got a different graph now. This time the graph is going to keep going past the yield point of the old one, 4.6, and go <clears throat> all the way up to 480. So it's about twice as high yield point before you start getting ductility. So it's elastic for a longer time. Of course, if your stress stays under 200, you wouldn't know the difference between the two bolts. You wouldn't know which one's which. But once you go after 240, aha, we must have a better bolt than this 4.6 one. <clears throat> 4.6 is about the lowest grade you can get. 6.8 <clears throat> goes to 480, 600. Our popular bolt is an 8.8, .8, so they go to 640 yield point, 640 megapascals, and the eight, the first eight stands for the 800 ultimate tensile. And 80% of that, which is 640, is the yield point. So that's yield. That's ultimate. Ultimate tensile strength is 800 megapascals. <coughs> you can also get a 10.9, which means it goes to 1,000 megapascals, getting pretty strong now. And uh, the yield point is 0.990%. Notice these percentages are getting closer and closer. So the yield point and the ultimates are getting closer together. And that's what happens when you harden material. you losing ductility. See, these soft bolts were going on and on and on. So they could stretch for ages like a piece of chewing gum, which means it's very hard for, to break those things. They take a lot of energy because the area under the graph is the amount of energy. Now, don't forget this line is very, very close to vertical. It's much straighter than I've drawn here. So that means the area under these graphs is tiny because it's almost a straight vertical line. So there's not much toughness in a 12.9 volt because it um, goes to 1200. Its yield point is at 1000 megapascals, 1080. <clears throat> so we have a fairly small amount of area if I do that graph. Uh, more vertical, which it should be. It should be much more like this. All right, so what it's showing you there is, uh, first of all, it's explaining what those bolt readings are on the top of the head. You look at the bolt. If it's a metric bolt, it should have two numbers with a decimal place in between, and those numbers can be read to tell you what is the um, bolt properties. Why am I going to go? <coughs> Oops, uh, just here. Right, so here we have the 12.9, so that means that's a very strong bolt. It goes to 1200 megapascals, and 90% of the 1200, which is 1080, is the yield strength. 8.8, .8, popular bolt for structural um, bolted connections. 800 megapascals with 80% of that, 640 being the yield point. So there's a table of those bolt types. Also telling you the range of the bolt sizes um, that you can get, <clears throat> the 12.9 being uh, the highest one on the table. There is some that are higher than 12.9. There are a few, but they'll, they'll start to limit the size. You probably can't make them at 100 mil diameter. The M here stands for metric. So M, when you say M5, you're talking about a metric bolt of 5 mil diameter. Uh, up to a metric bolt of 100 mil diameter. You don't normally get bolts much bigger than 100 mil because by that stage you're better off having lots of small bolts rather than one great big bolt. <coughs> Alright, so that leaves us with two properties we're going to spend a bit more time explaining. Um, 
we have the property of fatigue and the property of creep. And fatigue is probably the most important because uh, it's uh, very common in engineering. We have a video here which I want you to watch because that will explain it quite well. Uh, I'm just going to go over it fairly briefly myself because we are running a bit low on time. Uh, we're going to finish at 7.30. <coughs> um, basically, fatigue means that the object is getting stressed and unstressed repetitively, so on and off, um, which is exactly what happens inside an engine of a car. For example, the piston is going up and down, so the stress is getting applied to um, the crankshaft, for example, on and off, you know, like millions and millions of times. And when that, when that happens, if there's a crack in the object, then that crack will grow. And we've got an example of a photograph here of a shaft which failed in fatigue. So what's happened is somewhere around the shaft, it could have been here or somewhere, a crack began to grow, and there's a little crack, tiny little crack. But because of the crack, the sharp edge of the crack has very high stress. And so every time it was tensioned, that stress, that, that crack would grow a tiny bit. And then maybe a you know, hundred atoms or something. And then it was compressed again, and then the next time it's in tension, it cracks a bit more. And that just keeps going. It keeps repeating itself until it's done millions and millions of cycles. By that stage, it's it's working its way through the shaft and so in this particular shaft you can see those lines through there which is an indication of where the crack was growing so eventually there's only like this much shaft left and uh, when you've only got a little bit of shaft left next time you turn the machine on boom the whole shaft cracks and that's where you get the rough failure at the end which is just a catastrophic failure in one go <coughs> classic example of a fatigue failure where the, this fatigue part of the crack is nice and smooth looks sort of like a, a seashell has kind of lines in it and it's smooth and then the rough part is the catastrophic failure where it was just an ultimate tensile strength failure uh, instant instant failure all right so what is fatigue fatigue is a crack and what causes it on and off loads and what effect does it have? It means that you can break the specimen at a stress that is lower than the yield point. Alright, remember the yield point? The yield point is this one here, end of the elastic region. The fatigue strength, or fatigue, is down here somewhere less than the yield point. If you're up here past the yield point, that's not fatigue. Alright, for example, if you're trying to break a piece of wire and you've, got, you've left the pliers in the car and you just need to break it, you can just bend it backwards and forwards and keep doing that until it breaks. And you'll feel it get hot as you're doing it. Well, that's not really fatigue because you're way past the yield point here. You're, bent, you're bending it like this, then you bend it back and you bend it forward. So it, although it's similar to fatigue where it cracks slowly grows, what's really happening there is you're doing a type of work hardening and that's why it's uh, way up here in the graph. <clears throat> so it's sort of similar, looks like fatigue, but it's not exactly the same. Fatigue is under the under the um, yield point. All right. Now, some specimen, uh, some materials have a uh, endurance limit, which means if you stay under a certain stress, it should last indefinitely. Steel does that. Uh, once more, another reason why steel is a good material. That's why 70% of the metals that we use in the world is steel, because it's really good. It's very stiff. It's very strong. And it's very good in fatigue. That's why almost everything inside an engine is made out of steel if it's under stress, like shafts and crankshafts and um, camshafts and pins and bolts. They're all steel. Don't see aluminium bolts very often. <coughs> all right, and um, other materials like aluminium, for example, B would be an aluminium curve. Um, they don't show this fatigue, uh, this endurance limit where if you stay under stress, they never break. And so this explains why aircraft have a limited lifespan, because eventually they will crack. So you can only fly them for a certain amount of time, and then it goes into an aircraft graveyard where they can just um, scab some pieces off it, but they won't be able to use those wings anymore. <coughs> 
All right, so there, there are uh, two things about a, a specimen. Now, what, how do we read this graph? Well, these down the bottom are the number of cycles. So 10 to the 3, that's a 1,000 cycles. That's really too low for fatigue. That's why it's not really on the graph. That's 10,000. That's probably like the very lowest of what you might call fatigue, 10,000. 10, Remember I said when you're breaking wire, you might bend it backwards and forwards maybe 10 times, which isn't even anywhere near on the graph. It would be way over here. So that's not fatigue. So 10,000 cycles is really where fatigue would start. Most fatigue things are probably a million to uh, a billion cycles. So if you work out the number of cycles in a car engine, you're in the hundreds and hundreds of millions and billions of cycles. So it's really high numbers. <clears throat> um, by the way, how do they make these graphs? They actually have to get a specimen and put a load on it and then run it and see how long it lasts, and that plots one point. So it might take them a month to run the test just so they can plot one point. Very laborious task drawing these graphs up. You don't always have fatigue graphs for every material. <clears throat> All right, so what do we do about fatigue to make it uh, less likely to happen? Uh, watch the graph, they'll, they'll tell you. But most, mostly you, you make it smooth. Uh, you have sharp points and sharp edges and rough surfaces. Those sorts of things are going to make uh, fatigue more likely to happen. So we want our surface finish. Um, we don't want a rough surface finish. We don't want high temperatures. Um, we don't want stress concentrations, which is like a sharp corner. And also, when they're bigger, they tend to uh, be more likely to fail as well, just because there's more chance of a crack. All right, so there are a few things that they can do to reduce um, cracking happening as well. Um, just just go through that video. There's some details on uh, designing for fatigue. All right, we just um, finish up with this last little one. Creep is um, is sort of like fatigue, but it's um, not to do with cracking. It's to do with stretching. So fatigue is about cracking. Creep is about stretching. Um, they got right into creep when they were trying to make jet engines because the blades are red hot inside a jet engine, by the way, that's how hot it is in there. And so uh, that's a lot hotter than the inside of a, of a um, piston engine, they don't have red hot steel in there. But um, red hot turbine blades spinning at high speed is a creep problem. So because we've got the high temperature and we've got the stress from uh, centrifugal force, the blades want to get longer. If they get longer, they're going to start touching the sides and rubbing on the outside of the motor turbine, uh, which is not a good idea. So they had to study creep. They had to come up with alloys that don't creep as much. And um, they also, when they're doing maintenance on an engine, they measure the length of the blades to see if they've grown. So they pull the engine apart, maybe after 10,000 hours or something, and um, and measure the length of each blade. Every blade would be numbered and, and labelled and logged, so they know how long it was last time. Now we measure it this time, and they can work out when they should pull that blade out and go, ah, it's going to get too long in a minute, and it's about to go. So the typical graph of, in a creep situation is that you have the stage 2 creep, which is okay, but once it starts to accelerate, like this stage 3, that's when you pull it out and go, nah, that's gone to get it. So you're plotting this curve nice and steady, that's good. And once it starts to go into stage 3, accelerating creep, get it out of there. What causes creep? The two things are heat and stress. Heat and stress, that's turbine blade right away. Um, heat is also um, quite important for, uh, quite dependent on, on the material itself. So they were able to come up with alloys, steel alloys, with a lot of nickel in them, which creeped less. So they're not as creepy, I guess. Um, and they're kind of related to stainless steel. Stainless steel has nickel, but these are um, called super alloys, and they have even more nickel in them. Nickel, of course, is a pretty expensive metal. That's why stainless is expensive, mainly because of the nickel, because it's an expensive metal. All right, so um, that's about it for creep. It's um, oh, another thing about creep is some materials, 
will creep at room temperature, like lead, for example. In fact, in this video, somewhere, did I see? There we go. There's a photo of that video. I'm actually showing you that lead will creep. Here we've got lead solder, which is lead and tin mixed together. And we hang that over the um, table, and it slowly goes down. Now, that's creep. If that was copper, and I hung it over the table, it would go down but stop. Right? It wouldn't just sit there and slowly go down. The fact that it's slowly going down means that it's actually creeping at room temperature, which is what lead does. Whereas copper and steel would have to be heated up for that to happen. In case of steel, it would be hundreds of degrees. Okay. Here is a list of all the questions in the quiz. So you've got them in front of you. And there's also a quiz in Moodle that you can indefinitely practice. So let's just jump over to Moodle. So go back home, hit the Moodle button. <clears throat> log. Ah, here we go. So you log your, you put your name and password in here. I want you to test that. That would be good if you could do that tonight. Log yourself in. My password. Log yourself in, and you'll get um, you'll get a enroll me button that you have to push, and then you get to materials. And then uh, if you hit the welcome, you probably won't, but you hit welcome. Just make sure you're in this tab, SAG. It stands for um, Student Assessment Guide. And these these chapters take you back to the website, so don't forget those. Um, here's practice quizzes with unlimited attempts, All right? So mechanical properties, click that one, and you can just play quiz until you're happy that you can get them all right. So <clears throat> these are those um, properties that we were looking at uh, during the lesson. The ability of material to resist indentation or abrasion, which one is it? Plasticity, elasticity, mobility, hardness. All right, and you pick one of those, hit the check button, and see how you went. Material, so this would be, so what's the answer there? Indentation or abrasion, that's hardness. So hit check. All right, we got that right, and over here in our list of questions here, we've got our tick here, number one. All right, that's Moodle. That's how you put marks down in uh, pretty much all of the engineering units apart from hand in assignments. Ability of a material to sustain a high load of force for its size, all right? So it's a lot of force uh, for a size. You're comparing force and size together. That's force over area, which would be stress. Elasticity, start, stiffness, hardness, strength. There's no word stress there. But what's the word similar to stress? Strength. In fact, if it starts with S-T-R-E, then you can pretty much treat them the same. Strength is the the um, property of what stress can handle before it breaks, it yields, it fatigues, blah, blah, blah. Material requires a high stress to deform a small amount. How much stress does it take to deform? That's the stretching compared to the strain. So that's stiffness. Ultimate tensile strength is a measure of the something that it can handle. All right, so see those questions. So you go through those and keep practicing them. Um, you've got unlimited practice of quiz one. Because we want uh, we want you to know quiz uh, these basic properties off by heart. Okay, so that's um, that's materials. Um, you have that first quiz to practice. You also have those. Um, don't forget uh, to watch these videos as well. They're about uh, 20, 24, 20 minutes. Properties of materials, which will pretty much cover what I covered tonight. There will be more detail in the second video on fatigue, though, and that you, you want to watch that because uh, there's some handy stuff in there. And uh, and then fire up that quiz.
70 cent pass mark so you repeat that quiz until you get 70 percent and then you're right you go on to the next one we, we, we run another properties of those materials well watch those extra videos um those two videos there and practice the quiz that's it for materials